Well, hello there, my friends. Chris Marcus here with you for Arcadia Economics. Back in the Silver Room, oh, I guess that would be every room wherever I go. Um, joined by my good friend Jim Forsyth of the Citizens for Sound Money. And Jim, I think uh, I know you have some announcements to make on that, which we will get to today. But if I may start this episode off by just bragging for a moment, it's it's over on the other side of the room. But I realized, well, before I brag, perhaps an apology, because I realized that especially given what I come on and say on the show every day, my fiat to silver ratio in my pocket on a daily basis was quite vile and almost of a Keynesian nature. I think actually when I saw you in Washington, I was strapped up pretty good. In fact, I, uh, I have one of my as I duke it out in the bowels of socialism in Austin, Texas, I have a silver bullet in my pocket. I haven't needed to take the 10 ouncer out yet. Hopefully that won't be necessary. But with that said, it's great to have you here. Talk some sound money, some silver and all the action of our day. And how are you, sir? Good. Yeah. And when we got together, you gave me an Australian coin and uh, another coin. And my wife saw the Australian coin. She goes, that's mine. <laughs> you say that's mine mate yeah because she uh she visited australia australia for like six months as, as a kid so she snagged that one well understandable women do love silver uh no surprises there and um actually it's interesting we do have a lot of viewers i hear from in australia and it seems as if uh, in terms of the silver community i would say my impression seems like a lot of us and canada Australia, some British people, and it seems like the uh, Europeans get taxed out. But just interesting that I think American, a, a lot of the silver demand is driven from America. So it's folks like you, Jim, which makes it pleasure to have you here today and dig into the silver market, uh, which we will do. And I have a few questions that I'm excited to go over with you, but. What do you say first we do our monthly magic trick? And uh, I'm not sure if any of CFTC commissioners yet watch the show, but, you know, just to build the audience, you never know, a word might get out there. We look into the options expiration, which is one of the uh, Silver Bullion Bank's favorite time to rig the markets. Uh, you're familiar with this uh, school of thought, Jim? Oh, yeah. Um, Chris Ruther Glenn on Twitter does a great job following this and, and posting the um, max pain price and the historical, how close they come to it each time. Who is that? Uh, Chris Ruther Glenn on Twitter. Chris Ruther Glenn. Well, you'll have to send me that. I'd love to see what. Yeah, no, it's great. He's seeing on this one because I was looking at Friday's price. Uh, I had a couple other things going on and I saw, on uh, no, uh, no news or supply and demand changes that I was aware of, silver went from 2760 um, and then the industry shifted the value of a commodity up 40 cents over the first couple of hours. And then maybe there was a big supply uh, overload somewhere <laughs> that it didn't see that shot it down. So that was over 28 bucks. And here it gets under 28.20. So the first... <laughs> Jim, I, I, I mean, from a different perspective than mine, does, does this seem odd that, you know, in something that's theoretically a stable commodity, I mean, we've had silver, if it's no different than lumber, or, well, actually you shouldn't say that because lumber is skyrocketing already. But I mean, <laughs> we always like Wall Street, they always talk about the utility stock as this low volatility thing. I mean, silver, if it's really just this commodity that no one cares about, this should be like zero volatility volatility almost yet it just seems odd to me that between uh you know nine o'clock and in three hours the price of silver what's a, a dollar out of 28 128 you know a, a percent or two what, what do you say to that yeah i mean it's it's the kind of fractional nature of it um all the trading bots that are active the large number of contracts that change hands relative to the amount of physical uh, but yeah, th this is why the, the the futures market was created. You know, there's a State Department memo that says, you know, if we create a futures market, it'll create volatility and uh, discourage people from hoarding gold and silver. 
you know, this was after we went off the gold standard. So um, yeah, it's, it's doing as intended and um, trying to scale people away. The good news is, is like people seem to be a lot smarter about it. Now you look at PSLV has just been continuously adding. There's been some times where the volatility, we'll that. <laughs> yeah, sometimes where the volatility moved down, slows down the ads, or maybe it stops for a couple of days, but, but it's been it's nice tamped down a little bit. Yeah. Tamp it down a little bit. You never know. It, it, I've heard sometimes. It shocks me how when the price goes up, people are buying. When the price goes down, they stop buying. That's not what you're supposed to do. You're supposed to buy it when it, it's going, you know, when it's lower. Jim, what would you say if I told you, I, I've even as, heard something as wild as a regulatory commissioner talking about controlling the price and volatility. I don't know if it was him or, uh, you know, the market structure, hard to know on these things, which is why the transparency of the agency is so important. And <laughs> speaking of which, we, we won't get sidetracked today, but I did find new footage. Ross has been, at, he won't, doesn't like me apparently, go we'll figure, but he has been out giving interviews. Uh, I mean, <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll come back to that. But anyway, what I was wondering when I saw this on Friday, because I thought, gee, that's uh, an unusual move. Now, I will be clear, Jim, in all uh, transparency, I'm not a lawyer like any of the commissioners at the CFTC. I only have uh, experience trading equity options on the American and New York Stock Exchange where we had to buy or sell and turn a profit or else you, you know, you'd stop doing it. So my credentials may not be quite on par Although, given that option trading is a science of really your pricing volatility, um, I did study that for a while, and I thought the shop I worked for was good, but um, I never remember seeing a distribution quite like this, very unusual, uh, not quite the standard normal bell curve that they teach in the business schools. But as I saw this, and I was trying to extrapolate for my Wharton background, I didn't remember anything there that training for such a thing. Yet, fortunately, from watching other conspiracy theory silver shows, I was able to remember, oh, yes, options expiration is coming up tomorrow, which actually would explain why when the price is $28, that on really no, no news, that would fall 80 cents just like that. Um, because, Jim, here's a little trick that is fun for the, you can do this with your, show your kids too. Uh, make sure uh, they're not using it as licensed trading advice because I'm <laughs> just a dude with a dog and a YouTube channel. So clearly that would be silly. But if you just want to have some fun with the kids here, you see this 2700 here, which represents the $27 strike. So you see over here is the open interest and what typically happens just about every month. I think I'm like three for my last three on this one. So we'll see if we can keep the hot streak going. I'm not as good as JP Morgan because, you know, I don't commit felonies, but um, I can read their footprints uh, to an increasingly more accurate degree as time goes by. And you see here, the 27 strike, there's 609 contracts. Here at the right. 27 half, there's 400 then at the 28 strike, there's 936. And you also have, you know, you can see the whole board here. Um, typically, now this is a generalization uh, in my experience and the experience, uh, I know Dave Franzler, I actually learned it from Adelbear on this one. So hats off to investment research dynamics. Typically, <laughs> when you see these numbers, you know, that's usually just the banks <laughs> writing options. In fact, in my misguided youth, I was kind of intimidated whenever I heard these like banks and quantitative mathematical derivatives. But essentially, they're just writing insurance policies endlessly and hoping the house never catches on fire, even though they're doing the equivalent of doubling down while the house has already burnt to the ground and just hoping they can change the rules so they never get pinned with a loss. Uh, tactic that actually was popularized uh, by the Nazis in their gold trading during World War II, uh, amongst other areas and regions of the world. But anyway, to make a long story short, if the price goes over $28 at expiration, they start paying out big time. Right. Here, the 2750s, if it goes over that, they start paying out on this 403 lot. So essentially, when you look at this, if you could hammer the price to any uh, 
points you wanted and you could get actually vote on the regulatory structure even after you got caught manipulating the price. Essentially from the call side, you'd want to like, if you get it 27 or below, then they just collect all of the premium on all of those and screw their customers in similar fashion to what their traders described in the confessions to the CFTC and Department of Justice over the last couple of years, which would hold more weight if they weren't continuing to do it again month after month. But um, how about I stop there and you let me know if that's clear or if you have any questions. No, uh, yeah. Uh, you, so if you take this with the put side, it creates this curve and, and the banks want the price to finish at the bottom of that curve because it minimizes the payouts and they get to collect all those premiums. And Chris Ruther Glenn would post this, you know, like a month in advance on, on what the current structure looked like. It would evolve over time. But I swear you could take an option butterfly and like throw it out at where that price was going to be. And, um, you know, butterflies are really cheap at a, if they're out of the money and uh, do pretty well on that. So th they, they tend to hit their target of causing max pain quite closely. That, that was you trading those butterflies? That Not was on the futures those... market on just like GLD, SLV. Yeah. It was one of those trades uh, from our training. Essentially, we took the role of a poker player who was trying to watch out for the guy who's about to pick you off. And when the tourists come, just welcome them with open arms. And when somebody quoted a butterfly, they traded very rarely. But it was usually either someone who really knew what they were doing or really didn't know what they were doing. But I would not want to trade a butterfly. If you if you propose a butterfly, I, I would I would fade my market and run for the hills. Um, yeah, although no, interesting, I, you could probably come up with some intricate option strategies based on this. Uh, what were you going to say there, Jim? Oh, I wouldn't advise anybody to do it, but um, it, was, it was just kind of a fun thing to do because Chris Ruther Glenn would say, okay, you know, th th this is where Max Payne price is. And, it, you know, good deal away from where the current price was. And, you know, you know the date. So the butterfly is a way to take a bet that says, I think it's going to be at this price on this date. And if you get that right, it's like a big payoff. So it's it's a total gamble, but it you know it tended to work decently well. Which is yeah. It, it, well, it shouldn't, right? You know what are the, the you know the option strategy saying? The odds are really low that it's going to be there, but then it would be there. Well, unless the fix is in, which <laughs> right, uh, right. I mean, we already knew that part, and um, that's why here at uh, our forensic uh, trading lab. These are the types of things. Fortunately, that I, I guess it's one of those things, once you stop thinking, will it ever end? Or, In fact, I challenged myself here. Ooh, this would be a great growth opportunity. I want to win a trade where I'm short silver. Because, all right, you know, if I'm trading efficient, efficiently, obviously I can have my longer term bias. But that's something I've thought about before. Uh, maybe, I don't know, you can comment if you've gone through this thought process. But I mean, all right, I, I think over the long term, uh, there's going to go where it's going to go. But at least to whatever degree, I'm trading in a shorter term sense, which I don't do a lot of. But can you, for a silver bug, can you step away from that bias? And if the data indicates... Uh, for example, if I if I had in my current account set up the ability to sell options, uh, I could see shorting those, uh, especially that 28 strike call. I could see shorting those. And that's not licensed trading advice for anyone out there. But you get what I'm saying, Jim? It's like, can a silver bug, can you be objective enough in your trading that if the data says, well, I think there's a reason to believe that I put this bet on X number of times that it's going to go down in this situation. Uh, have you ever thought about that at all? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, first off, I'm incapable of just going short silver. I can't, I can't do it. I can't bring myself to do it ever. Um, but what I can do and, and do do is, you know, if I think it's going to get smashed, options expiring come up, um, I'll stay long, say PSLV, and then get some puts to protect the downside. And if it gets smashed down, cash out the puts, buy some more PSLV. Um, so I, I thought a lot about how to, you know, use the volatility um, to your advantage kind of thing. If they're going to make it volatile, let's use it to our advantage and use it to buy more silver. So 
I, I totally think that's a fair thing to do. Um, you know, but I'm, I'm always long. I, I, I like in, in Citizens for Sound Money, we have gold and silver, K, G and K, U. And every once in a while, I'll be like getting a little, maybe there, it's going to get knocked down and I'll go to cash a little bit. It's like, I can't do it. I, I, I can't be in cash. Well, and it's, it's, it's a tricky one. I've never seen any other market quite like silver. Although Nibbles has been running some algorithms on a few things to test. Uh, I think I'm almost close to having minute by minute silver data. There's a lot of things I want to back out. For example, every time silver falls by 80 cents in three hours or less, you know, what can I extrapolate about, you know, are there any patterns of what happens before that happens and all sorts of things, uh, you know, that will be fun to study. Uh, we're actually looking to publish, start publishing more data on a lot of interesting queries to provide some more transparent it's actually the silver market. It's actually interesting. I was looking at the charts, especially for gold, because gold's kind of seen this slow and steady rise up. Um, and I started thinking about it. And I mean, that's kind of how we'd like it to act. You know, don't spike up, just like a nice steady, you know, up a little bit, down a little bit, but keep moving up. And um, silver has been a little more volatile, but if you look at silver since about a week after the squeeze started, the volatility is a lot lower than it was prior. I mean, we had dollar down days. We had like four of them prior to silver squeeze. Um, and that seems to have gotten, uh, it's, it seems to be people are, somebody's quickly buying the dips even in the futures market. Um, <laughs> Well, Jim, let's not be so hasty. You may not be saying that by this time tomorrow. So. I mean, yeah, so that's bad. I mean, that's <laughs> that's an 80, 60 cent <laughs> drop, right, intraday. But I was talking like... Plus cents. I may even be able to back 85, 6 or 7 yeah. out of there. And yeah. actually, now again... By the way, that, that was a day when SLV added like 1.8 million. <laughs> I well, said it didn't seem to affect the price, and Happy Wine said, "Yeah, it did. The price went down." <laughs> well, I've wondered how they're always adding so many shares on the day the price goes down. Although, actually, I think I figured it out, Jim. Uh, although, let let us finish the option board here first, and then will you kindly remind me to explain what I think happens with SLV? See if I can do it without exposing. <laughs> Actually, could I expose myself to legal risk for SLV? I mean, is that possible? We'll try anyway. But here uh, to finish this up on the put side, actually quite light on the 27 half, 28 strike. You see the 27 puts. So the banks or whoever is short these puts, which is typically the banks, um, would lose if the price starts going underneath that. So the puts... Not a big position, but they lose under 27. And the calls, you see, really, the sweet spot would be about $27 yeah. if they are able to pull that off, which I don't know that it's always quite as cut and dry as that. But, and again, the way we approach things, option trading, it's not, I mean, if you're getting... 60 40 odds on a coin flip that's fair if you take those that bet you know and you say heads and it's tails all right jim i got option trading question for you if is that a, if let's say you take that bet i'm going to give you 60 40 odds on an even coin flip and you say heads and it goes tails did you make a good bet if i took the 60 side yeah so even though you lost on that specific bet because the odds were in your favor, are you saying that you, you did make a good decision, a good bet yeah, and, well, and, with the information you had? And, and, and the more times you place that bet, the better you're going to be. Yeah. Right. Which is essentially what the blackjack wheel or the casino does. So, you know, the way I approach any of these, I mean, it's not an exact science, but I don't know. In fact, uh, Jim, I actually am working on getting an option set up. I want to start streaming market maker quotes again. See if... Uh, now that I don't have, now I'm not the young buck, and all I got is my curveball, a little trickery left. If I could, if he still got it, but either case, I wouldn't be surprised to see something like this at, at some time before the end of tomorrow. I'm not actually sure what time they mark the uh, 
mark off the cutoff. I think, I think it's like 130 Eastern. For the options expiration? I think so. It's not like end of day. It's sometime in the middle of the day. Okay. But, but so, I know that's for the gold one, I think. But silver, I think, is the same time. Yeah. So I would imagine uh, we'll see how successful it is. But, I mean, you're already kind of in the sweet spot. But I would say <laughs> highly... <laughs> In terms of if you wanted to bet whether the silver price was likely to go up or down in the next 24 hours, that would be a time where I would take the short side of that. Again, if people are talking about physical gold and silver, I would just sit there and watch with amusement. Um, but for those traders out there, um, certainly in my opinion, and, uh, Jim, you can tell me if you agree or not, but on an even money bet, I would take the price going down between now and options expiration. How about you? Um, I don't know. I think 20, 27 to 28, you know, cause all those things at 28, you know, there's pressure pushing it up, right? They don't seem to want it to break 28, but. It's the beach but ball yeah. underwater but it's like can you stick it another three feet underwater for the next couple of hours that's what well, i would imagine we will see attempted and i would guess likely to i'll say we're probably around 27 okay how about this jim a friendly ounce of silver i'll make a market and you can trade on it if you want okay so i say by let's we'll call it one uh, 130 tomorrow I'd say we're between 27.20 and 27.60. Wait, at a specific time you're saying? By Whenever, let's, we'll call options expiration, let's say tomorrow Oxford. afternoon. At I'd say we're somewhere in between here that it's slightly lower. Okay, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll take that bet. I'm probably wrong, but. So you're gonna say I, outside of that range? Yeah, like below 28, but above that range. All right, so we'll call 2760 the cutoff line. I'm taking the under on 2760. If it's above 2760, you are the victor. Sound good? Yeah, now, to be clear, it's like at options expiration. I, I totally can see it slam down and touching there. I think it'll be a beach ball, though, and pop back up. You pick the time. How about we make it... Uh... Well, just options expiration. We'll, we'll figure out what time that is. I'm pretty sure it's 1.30. Fine. We'll, we'll double check that and we will mark it to whatever time we come up with there. I think you are correct. Uh, so, and uh, you have 2760 and over for the win and the silver Chris bearish on silver for the next, uh, you know, 21 hours. It almost hurts to think it, but I think there's a good chance we see something like that. Although I pray that I'm wrong because I think what's going to happen eventually is that, you know, you keep stuffing it underwater someday it pops and in terms of signs, we may be headed somewhere closer towards that. Um, interesting data here, Jim. In fact, this has changed quite a bit because now over the last four weeks, we're starting to see metal go back into SLV. Now it's coming out of the COMEX. There's 9 million out. Although even about two weeks ago, there was metal coming out of the COMEX and iShares, but going into PSLV, which is this one down here, so at least the last couple of times I've looked, I've been seeing metal into PSLV, out of COMEX, and then uh, you know some variation in iShares. I know you track that data pretty closely. What, what are you seeing? Yeah, so it was, um, I think last week was the first week for SLV inflows. Yeah, first week since early February. And last week it was 9 million ounces uh, into SLV, 1.4 into Sprott. But yeah, that's the first. Like 2 million on Friday, I think. Yeah. And do you think this is just that people are, or what, what actually, I won't even, what, what is your interpretation of the, because we're seeing unusual shifts of metal. I mean, it's coming out of the COMEX. I'll pull up the, uh, actually, it's been interesting looking at the uh, COMEX warehouse, which has been declining ever since February 2nd, coincidentally enough. I mean, go figure that. 
Wow, goodness. It had stayed, it had been stuck at 360 for a while. So it looks like another 7 million ounces have come out there. Um, on February 2nd, or pretty close to it, it was about 400 million ounces. Seeming to get the uh, six month chart here. But again, really since uh, uh, February, Silver Squeeze weekend, we've seen metal come out of COMAX. A lot going into PSLV um, and mixed on SLV. Do you anything that you're extrapolating from that? Well, I did. I did do a chart um, that, and this was Happy Hawaiian suggested it, where you look at the net flows. You look at SLV flows, PSLVs in the net, and then um, you know look at that over the span of two weeks or a week and then compare that to the price move. And there's definitely a correlation with the net flows. You know, when there are net inflows, it's correlated to increasing price and vice versa. And if you look at that chart, the SLV is over here, PSLV is over here, and the net's like right in the middle. It's, you know, there's these huge outflows in SLV over the last couple of months, big inflows for PSLV. And the net is, you know, was slightly negative when SLV started to slow their, not even add when they started to slow down their redemptions, then PSLV started to create net inflows. And of course the physical market on top of that adds to it as well. So, uh, so I, I'm really focused on the flows versus the price. I believe the price will follow. Um, so that's why I track PSLV flows, SLV flows. Um, I don't have a good way of tracking the physical markets. There's good people that, that do that. Um, and that's obviously very important. you're muted. Chris, can you hear? Chris, I can't. I can't hear you. Oh, I'm sorry. I had my uh, <laughs> mic muted. Nibbles was slurping in the background. Um, I thought it was me. I'm like messing with my speakers here, trying to. No, no, no. That was that was me. My fault. So a quick recap. <laughs> We've seen metal come out of here ever since Silver Squeeze weekend. The LBMA told us they were running out of metal. Then they told us the reason that nobody could figure out how SLV added so much metal. Apparently they miscounted it too. So we don't even know whether anything really went in or whether it was double counted. Like seems like it would almost have to have been. And to the degree that, you know, I mean, I don't know how long it will end or whether it'd be next month, but then we have this whole Basel three BIS thing which seems like the, they're, they're talking about the BIS basically ending the paper silver shorting conceivably, which seems like not the type of thing they would do. To me, I think maybe they'll do it if they realize they've reached the end of the road and they, they have no metal left and they have to reset it. It's one of those things where it's kind 
hard to know when it's finally happening, but at least in terms of the pieces that would need to be in place for something like that, that's what I've been wondering about. And I'm curious what you would say to any of that now that hopefully you heard me. Yeah. Um, yeah in terms of Basel three, I mean, I know LBMA is trying to delay it and you know, who knows, but um, what, what, what I think is, you know, there are countries that push for Basel three and there are people pushing for the same thing for the same reason is, you know, we under, you know, we understand that this is a fragile system, you know, it's highly leveraged and that, um, you know, the dollar's running, going to run into issues. And so that, that's kind of the whole push with Basel three. And so whether or not LBMA fights it, delays it, I, I don't think matters inevitably, you know, Russia and China can say, Hey, look, you know, we're, we're done with this. And, you know, the Shanghai exchange is mostly traded in physical. You've got Kinesis that's one-to-one -one physical that, that's growing. Um, so I, I think it's whether or not Basel III is obeyed and or, you know, delayed doesn't really matter other than timing. Well, I would agree with that. Although speaking of timing, first of all, Jim, I'm just going to throw another thank you out there. I know this isn't an easy day to make time because obviously you know how could anybody be focused on anything other than just three days away uh we've passed the 72 hour mark i believe here um from the u.s house committee on financial services having a virtual hearing with the amazing title i'm gonna have to borrow this one for uh they'll <laughs> read re retitle this video uh holding the mega banks accountable for silver options expiration, an update on banking practices, programs, and policies. Now, I'm not sure if these are the same policies that the CFTC installed that JP Morgan actually voted on uh, recently. <laughs> I know you think I might be making that up, but I do have the video evidence to prove it. Um, in either case, I wrote a letter to Representative Waters because in the past, uh, she's gone as far as to call some of these banks gangsters. And as I quoted her down at the bottom, she talked about how she wanted to rein these uh, criminals in. So I put together a file that, as you can see, there's lots of links here with evidence, but also some specific questions such as, Representative Waters, will you ask Jamie Dimon to explain why JP Morgan downgraded the silver sector on February 2nd before the market opened? while the silver trust that they are required to add or subtract the silver to was simultaneously setting an all-time record, and by quite a wide margin, I might add, for largest amount of silver added to the trust. Um, I didn't know if that was another coincidence similar to how they were the only bank really in position to know about Bernie Madoff's Ponzi scheme, which they pulled their own money out of first. Um, and, uh, of course, what, when you have the chance to talk with Jamie Dimon and David Solomon of the uh, God's Work doer Goldman Sachs, I figured, well, we might as well get some clarity on the uh, curious comments of Jeff Curry. Um, and Jim, I know you've supported and uh, done things with the great Dr. Paul before. And I guess I wonder, I don't know if... Uh, some people have questioned whether Representative Waters, they said, Chris, this is too complex for her. Although to that, I would say she is uh, chairing the or pictures on that U.S. House Committee on Financial Services. So I would think if she doesn't understand this, which was pretty clearly worded, but certainly she has access to the experts. Plus, I gave questions she could just ask directly uh, to these executives. Is that a reasonable request? I've paid more taxes than I think is actually my fair share, given that they funded the CFTC and people like you and I have to do their job for them while they remain uh, incredibly non-transparency, despite their speeches about transparency. And I'm hoping maybe this document will end, but any thoughts on any of this? Well, first of all, it looks like a great letter. And, and yeah, if, if she doesn't understand. I think she'll it. love it. I think she'll yeah. love it. Yeah, she's got people help her. I mean, what yeah. you got to keep in mind about politicians is their main goal is to get reelected. Right. And, and as long as people are kind of not saying anything and not being active, you know, they can kind of do whatever they want. Um, but when the tide starts turning and people get more and more vocal about these kinds of things, you'll, you'll start to see them act differently. Um, if Jim, we had a self-preservation. Along those lines, could I highlight this feature uh, that I added in here? Uh, 
but because I, I realized what you were saying and I figured as long as there's a, you know, if I could somehow position this, you know, uh, Waters, I believe, Democrat is a fine. We'll put it, blame the great chance to blame it all on the Republicans. Plus, I trust you will find this matter to be in the direct interest of your constituents as well as a lot of other frustrated voters who would eagerly support whoever finally puts an end to all the shenanigans. I mean, crime on Wall Street, she, she's made a campaign of, here's the video, we could check that, reigning in the chronic lawbreakers. Um, you know, and I, of, of course, everybody supports that. So um, any thoughts on, uh, is this the right way to approach things? I mean, I didn't do something like those fellas that walked in, the Capitol building after the police removed the barricades on January 6th. But I figured uh, rather than, I don't, I don't own any, any guns just, but I'm getting quite, my aim with my keyboard thumping is getting quite sharp, if I may say so. And uh, any thoughts on that legislative process? Well, yeah, I mean, first off the whole, you know, people will tell you, oh, you can't fight that, you know, you can't fight uh, Congress. Don't bother to write them. They're not going to do anything that, I mean, that, that's kind of a lie. I mean, when I was in the state house, um, the opposite party was really gung ho against restricting um, for restricting homeschooling. Well, then then we had four thousand homeschoolers and their kids show up at the state house, and that bill was just immediately canceled and just like put in the shelf. And then all of a sudden, everybody loves homeschoolers. So they want you to not write. They want you to not call. Um, you know, so they can do what they want to do. Um, but but the more people that write letters like this and the more people you can get to write letters like this, the better, because, um, yeah, people are angry and upset. And the more they they voice that and, and especially, you know, that they want to support somebody who will fix it, um, you know, change can happen. Yeah, well, I certainly agree, Jim, uh, because it's interesting. A lot of people have suggested to me that Maxine Waters wouldn't read my letter, which I thought that was unusual. I mean, again, the woman's campaigned on uh, cleaning up Wall Street fraud. I'm sure that, you know, nobody in the House Financial Services or Senate Banking Committee would be involved in profiting off of any of this, uh, obviously. So I thought it, this was a bipartisan issue that we could all support. And uh, along those lines, I did make this file available. And I apologize, I because I, you can download all of these. Here's my letter to Rostin Benham asking for clarity uh, for some of the non-bank participants who didn't get the memo, the TPS report about tamping down these things, as well as the two files of evidence they've been sitting on. Um, now, I did have it written out with all of the phone numbers and contact information. So you could contact Maxine directly because I'm sure she would want to know about this because obviously if you know, the House or the Senate knew this information was out there and didn't act and suppress this, I would think that would make them liable. So fortunately, if you go to Maxine Waters, she has two offices that you can contact. And uh, I'm going to get that information on here because like you said, Jim, I'm going to send it, but I'm sure there's a lot of people that don't want to get uh, be used as the uh, pin cushion for the JP Morgan voodoo doll in the silver market and would also like to make their voice known. And that way they can just come here, download this. I will get those numbers up. And uh, perhaps yeah. while we wait for Congress to act, which I'm sure will be any moment now, especially now that they have the evidence written in clear language. Because <laughs> remember how Jeff Curry said the, the inflows into the SLV trust were insignificant? <laughs> the only problem is that was flat out untrue. You can see... The only thing that was insignificant was pretty much any other data flow in history compared to the ones that he called insignificant, which seems like a material statement, at least from what I remember studying in my ethics classes at Wharton. But, you know, it could be a little foggy. I wasn't paying attention anyway. Um, anyway, Jim, now that citizens are armed with some of this knowledge and that there's a letter out there, they don't have to write it down, but they could just go to Congresswoman Waters or, you know, the Senate Bank Committee, uh, Mitch McConnell, is he still around there? Is he still in the game? Uh, I think so, yeah. Mitch, well, I mean, I'm sure I Mitch would support bank. that. Um, Paul Ryan, is that, is that the guy's name? Uh, he's, uh, you know, 
someone I would think would be interested in that information, or we could just send it to the citizens for sound money league. Then uh, I wouldn't have to really dumb it down to a first grade level when I write it. But Jim, for people who are looking for actual real men and women, not the uh, other kind that runs and then betrays their oath. Could you tell folks what Citizens for Sound Money is all about and uh, what's going on there? Sure, yeah, Citizens Sound Money is, um, is, an, is a nonprofit. We're applying 501c for 501c4 status. And um, our goal is to encourage the use of sound money and to protect people's right to do so. And when I say encourage, you know, you notice I say encourage people to use sound money. I'm not saying encourage the government to back the dollar with sound money, I'm saying encourage people to use sound money because because there's ways you can do that today already. And you know, Kinesis, as you see there, is, is a way that um, I'm using and 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 we're encouraging people to try it out. Um, you know, because you can spend your gold and silver, you can save your gold and silver um, in a liquid form, in a very spendable form. Send it to your friends and family. Um, hold, it helps you hold as few dollars as possible. Um, we're also going to start working on a, well, we have been working on it, just not ready yet. On um, Is that you and Marion Ward, a.k.a. Yeah. Red Silver Fox, yes. Dog Mom to Red Molly? Yes, Red Silver Fox, uh, Marion Ward, go back to our Ron Paul days. Um, she convinced me to uh, put together the nonprofit, um, and I'm, I'm glad she did. It's gone amazingly well. Um and gone so well, we decided we had some resources and wanted to present some uh, sound money leadership awards and thank people that have done a great job in the sector to, you know, highlight the need for sound money, um, also the need for price discovery in the precious metals market, the, the need to end manipulation, and, um, and um, also understanding macroeconomics, all these kinds of things, and uh, we... We took a, did a like about a one week nomination process, tried to spread around as much as possible. Um, and then we uh, opened up, opened up for voting for about a week. And of course, as soon as we open up for voting, we have people say, you forgot X, Y, Z. Um, uh, so some, some of the names that we didn't have on our polls. And once we started the polls, we had kind of, I didn't have the ability to change it. Um, Bob Moriarty, Bob Coleman, Jim Rickards, Bill Powell, Chris Powell, um, Bill Murphy, um, those, those, those folks were kind of nominated after the polling had started. So unfortunately we weren't able to include them in the voting process, but where do we, where does the voting, where's the polls? So the, the, um, see under blog, well, the voting's closed. How do we we're, get we're, is hopefully these, your polls are more accurate than the ones they used for the president. Those don't seem to come out quite as pretty forecast sometimes. So, so yeah, so these were the nominees. Um, oh. So yeah, if you can, can I screen share? I've got a PDF with all the awardees. All right, I will end my screen share and enable for you in the advanced sharing options. You're good to go, sir. Can't leave it to one of these rookie silver guys over here. So take it away. All right, where did my There we go. So um, a lot of windows open on the desktop, Jim. I got a lot of windows open. Yes, I do. A lot of irons in the fire, as they say. I do. I do. So yeah. So uh, Systems for Sound Money Award. We originally said ten. We expanded it out some, but um, the awardees will all uh, be able to receive a KVT a Kinesis Velocity token um, if if they don't want that, or they can give it to somebody else, or we can um, work on getting them something different. But um, you know, KVTs are ownership and kinesis, and, and if it becomes more rapid adopted as sound money, it could be a good investment. Um, but the most important thing is, is the recognition for these people, not necessarily the award itself. Um, so the, these are, are the winners. Uh, I won't read all of this. We'll get this posted, but William Middlecoat um, has been very visible in terms of highlighting uh, all sorts of issues. Um, and uh, he did very well in the voting. Gold Ventures uh, on Twitter, somebody so I followed, a great chartist, but um, has given a lot of free advice and woken a lot of people up to, to what's going on. Um, now, he has a lot can of- Can you go back? He's a keyboard warrior? Wow. Yeah, we don't, we don't know who he is. Um, 
but uh, he's got maybe like, it's Dick Hayes's uh, alter ego, yeah. his, his pen name. <laughs> There's all sorts of theories, but um, what's funny is you know he endorsed Kinesis a while back, and he has plenty of KVT, but he's going to get another free one. All righty, um, Mike Maloney. Um, so um, yeah, you could probably talk more to a lot of these. Um, and of course, Dr. Ron Paul, um, you know, has been been at this for decades and interviewed. Can we take the bullseye Dr. off of Dr. Paul, please? Oh Sorry. yeah, good, good point. <laughs> Why did it change to a target? You could like pat him on the head if you want. No, just we'll keep the bullseye uh, over there. Wait. And Chris Marcus. Oh goodness, where is this picture from? Where is this guy? I don't know. Uh, Marion put these together. Um, what, what's interesting is, is a lot of the people did the well in voting were people focused on the manipulation aspect. Um, I think you beat out, I think you got more votes than Dr. Paul, actually. Um, wow. Well, I, I, if I may, I was having a good hair day in that. <laughs> yeah, it looks nice there. Nice comb over. And uh, I think I had a little gel back in the day there, but thank you. I'm on, honored to be a part of well, I really am honored to be a part of the silver world. I mean, it's like, these, you know, it's, I guess that's the, maybe the point of life when there's something that you care about and feel is, uh, I often like to think of it. If you gave someone $40 million and say, all right, what are you going to do now after you travel and have your party? Like, what do you wake up and do? I mean, I want to see how this ends up. And uh, it's, I, maybe if there were to pick one single favorite part, I don't know, it sounds snobby, but it's like the people who get into silver and get this stuff, they're great people. It's like a cool uh, self-select, that doesn't sound right, self-selecting club, but I mean, it's just a nice subset of people. And that's one of the things I'm excited about as I travel a bit more, finding ways to get more people together so they can just experience these things, have someone to discuss the things they care about with, so... No, it's, it's, it's a great community. Like we, we've been selling KVT and I've accidentally sent two to somebody by accident and they'll tell me, they're like, you want me to send it back? Can I just go ahead and buy it? Um, very honest, honest folks. Um, I've been very happy. Craig Hempke, of course. And when, man, when the two of you guys get together, it's, it's fireworks. What's that? When the, when the two of you guys get together, I listened to your Wall Street Silver, I think interview was. Well, maybe we'll make we gotta mix you in there next time. And yeah. uh have you met Craig yet? I, I haven't. I kind of feel like I know him listening to him every Friday, but but I have not physically met him though. No. Well, we might be see, may, maybe seeing you as the Sprout money expert one of these weeks <laughs> before you know it. So there you go. Oh. Andrew McGuire. That's another good combination when Craig and, and Andrew get together. Um, you know, whistleblower for what JP Morgan did, and then um he, he works with Kinesis now. I don't know if we'll be able to give him a KBT, but I'm sure he can find somebody worthy to give it to. That might be a conflict. I heard he might have one or two. Yeah, he might have one or two. Yeah. You can never have too many. And uh, the happy Hawaiian. Um, so, you know, he, he was actually... I, he was actually campaigning for this a little bit, but it's well deserved. Um, the original. Well, I mean, he's the only guy Jeff Christian will talk to, so I mean, <laughs> that alone. Uh, I actually talked with him this morning, believe it or not. Uh, first time we actually talked uh, directly. Uh, really nice fella and writes uh, some impressive research. So uh, that's that's one of the things I think is cool is that in the span of last couple months with wall street silver we have like a whole new industry of like silver memes and it's like roasting dirty silver bankers has become a sport now <laughs> so well you that's know fantastic myself yeah he he kind of came out of nowhere and has rapidly established himself so he he sent an email or maybe he called sprott to say hey i'd like to talk to you about how to make PLSLB better um i don't know exactly what he said and he gets a message back said the ceo would like to talk to you this broad asset management CEO, you know, somebody told him, hey, Happy Hawaiian's asking to talk to us. Oh, let's get the CEO. And Happy Hawaiian invited me onto that. And we wound up talking to uh, um, John, this broad asset management CEO for an hour. John Campanella or something yep. like that? Yeah. Yep. Okay. Actually, uh, perhaps I've been, I, someone gave me his uh, name to reach out to. I've wanted to get 
someone who can speak to the specifics of the PSLV trust. And uh, perhaps you could help me get in touch with him. Um, although to what you just said with the happy Hawaiian, I think it's fantastic on a variety of levels. Um, perhaps most so in that is if there's ever been an industry that's different from all that other wall street crap where, you know, people say this, they say that, and then you can never get an answer. Like good luck getting someone on the phone in the precious metals industry. That's one of the things I love is that the mining companies, these guys will talk to you. You can call them and get your questions answered here. Someone had a good idea. He called and got in contact and that's what good businesses do. I mean, they, they listen to what the market is asking. That's why I spend the majority of my time is answering emails nonstop because I'm trying to understand what people want and how to bring solutions. And that's great. I think that's a great example for everyone seeing that someone had an idea and he went and it was received because it adds value. And perhaps along those lines, I get a lot of emails. People are saying, oh, you should send the letter here. You should send the letter there. And yes, and I, I appreciate those suggestions. Although what I think is exciting is that more and more, you don't need my permission. And I'll you take the stuff I write. And if there's someone you can send it to that'll open their eyes, do it. Just anything peaceful and you know that that's ethical, um, you know, I support and I, it's and I think this is a great example of seeing. I mean, you've done this, Jim. A lot of people are doing it now, and it and I think you know better that people often feel like they're just one guy, but when that stuff adds up, and actually, in my experience, it makes a difference. Is that what you saw with Dr. Paul as well? Oh yeah, definitely. I'm on. Hold on, on RP. Sorry. It's okay. Jim's getting a call from his broker there. <laughs> you know, so what, what is uh, Blue, Blue Horseshoe saying now? No, my step my stepson's in town, my wife, and and, and he just... Uh, well, get him on here. Maybe he knows the tomorrow's <laughs> price of silver. Did, is he looking at the option board or what? I got a... Uh, he, he called me, asked... He was interested in investing. I got him all set up a year or two ago and got him into some stuff. And I'm like... And it went up like 80% in two months. Well... I'm like, dude... I've been waiting for 10 years for this. I get you in and then it goes up 80% right away. I mean, what, what's going on here? Well, would you buy the kids some more silver? We could celebrate already. We'll be at 50 by summertime. Yeah, he's got some. He's got some. All right. Uh, near and dear to my heart, Larry Lapard or Lawrence Lapard. Um, he actually helped me get elected way back when. Um, just really great guy. I've been very outspoken and he's been through the pain of, you know, from 2011 till now. Um, you know, he stayed 100% in like I did, um, but but really strong ethical person, great performance on his fund. Um, so happy, happy to see him here. Um, John Adams, and yeah, I think this is another one that is, uh, you know, he, he, him being an outspoken critic, there was a lot of uh, voting for people that have really called um, fraud to task. So John Adams. Uh, Tavi Costa, just a, a wealth of information and very outspoken um, about about this sector. You know, he's not necessarily that's not his prime focus, but um, he's really educated a lot of people. Um, and then uh, we wanted to give a, an award for a chartist, and it was funny, Patrick, um, and I followed him for a while. It was like the final day of nomination. We were releasing the nominees and photos and all that stuff, and he's like, "Hey, wait, what? What is this?" <laughs> And so he didn't even know about it, um, but he's done some great silver charts. He went through uh, Gold Venture portfolio and charted all of that. Um, so we want to recognize his work. And then for macro, uh, Luke Groman, um, I subscribe to. Uh, um, so he's honorable mention for macro, but Lynn Alden was the, the people's choice for, for macro here. Uh, just did a really outstanding job of highlighting the macro issues that make uh, you know, sound money important. And then for reporting, uh, you know, other than yourself, you're, you're, you're a little bit of both. Um, but for reporting, Danielle, obviously famous in this industry, You've been doing this for a long time, great interviews. Um, and, and this is one where, you know, she's doing interviews as, as opposed to being an outspoken person, but, um, you know, the exposure she's given so many good people has been outstanding. Um, then Nate Fisher, um, he wrote this article on 4D chest with Eric Sprott that, that people on our board just really loved. And we want to recognize 
that article specifically, but then also a lot of the other work that he's done. Uh, Renaissance Man, people, people might know his name, but it's, it's uh, Renaissance Man is, is the site. And then finally, this wasn't on the voting list um, because it's you know not a specific person other than you know the, all the mods that do great work, Jim Lewis, Ivan, um, and, and um, Happy Wine's actually a mod as well. But Wall Street Silver's really made a big impact and, and we wanted to thank them, not just the people that organize it, but the individual members themselves. So this is really an award for the you know, 82,000 people that are involved in that, that, that have really inspired a lot of us people that have been, been doing this for a while, but finally have a lot of hope. So we, we wanted to, to provide an award to that organization. And that, that's it. Those are the, the awardees, I, I don't know, like 14, 15, I think. We went a little above what we initially intended. Um, there are so many good people that we want to recognize, including yourself. Well, I appreciate that. I'm just happy to be a part of these things that are going on. Uh, <clears throat> and I think it's exciting that we have things like awards now where, geez, they have, uh, you know, a uh, weird cultists that uh, celebrate Hollywood actors and have uh, Oscars, Emmys and all sorts of stuff. Um, and I think it's great. Jim, they're actually, after Silverfest won, I was thinking, is there a Silver Hall of Fame? And there is actually someone working on it. And uh, although I'd kind of like to have something where I might get to do it my way. So I'm going to have the Arcadia Silver Hall of Fame, which could be a subset wing of uh, another Hall of Fame. But again, you know, that everybody could have their Hall of Fame. And I just think it's great that it's like people care and it's becoming uh, its own community. A lot of the stuff I've done, I've, I've temp, uh, templated off of, you know, how the poker players, you know, you had poker and then all of a sudden it was on TV and you bring out the personalities, the characters. And uh, anyway, so is exciting times. And uh, Jim, I appreciate you joining me and being a good sound money advocate, um, especially because I was confused. I heard uh, it wasn't safe for people to old, own gold after the Fed lit a uh, credit bubble in the 20s that popped and then forced people to sell their gold, but then revalued the price, which was confusing to me, especially since our alleged greatest investor, Warren Buffett, said gold is a doorstopper. So hopefully you will be able to make some uh, sense out of all of these uh, shenanigans with the Sound Money League. It seems like uh, you're listening to people that aren't on government lists aside from the great Dr. Paul. And I appreciate you doing that. And you have to keep us posted how it all comes together. That yeah, sounds good. Thanks for having me on and, and helping me do these announcements and congrats to you. Well, thank you, Jim. I sure appreciate that. And we will look forward to checking in with you soon. Uh, and we'll check back around 1.30 Eastern tomorrow, see if silver is above or below 2760. Although I don't know whether I get a Jim ounce or give Jim an ounce. Either way will be fun. That is the blessing of silver. Something everybody, aside from your local J.P. Morgan bankers, can enjoy. And with that said, Jim, I'll look forward to checking in with you again soon, brother. All right. Thank you.